Inductors. Let's talk about inductors and inductance. First, we introduce an old favorite. The bar magnet. One of the coolest things in the world, the old bar magnet. And what we know about a bar magnet is there is a magnetic field, magnetic lines of flux that we think of circulating here, which I can simply draw in this little sort of two-dimensional arrangement. It is, of course, 3D, right? It's coming out behind the paper. So these magnetic lines of flux, right? We just refer to that magnetic flux. as the Greek letter phi, rhymes with pi. It's in Weber's. Now you could think of that as a certain number of lines. That's sort of a, a little maybe mental game, visual sort of game that we play. It's not like you could literally find lines but that's sort of the way we imagine it. And associated with this is something called flux density. And this is important in magnetic circuits. Flux density is measured in Teslas, and it's essentially how concentrated the flux is. So that's B, the flux density, is flux over area, A. And we would say that one Tesla is defined as one Weber per square meter. Okay? Now, here's a really cool thing about um, this whole magnetic field thing, and that is if we have a conductor. So here's a little wire that I'm going to draw and I pass a current through here. That creates a magnetic field. Matter of fact, we use something called the right-hand rule. If your thumb is going in the direction of conventional current, then the field is wrapping in the direction of your fingers. So we would see something like this. Here's the magnetic field. And as you might guess, the stronger the current, the greater that magnetic field. Right Now we can concentrate that. We can sort of crank it up by creating a loop. So imagine the current's coming in like this. Now using the right-hand rule, right, you can see what's happening here. These little current, these little um, flux lines are kind of coming around like this. So they're basically concentrating inside, right? Make another one like that. So you can increase the flux density by doing this. As a matter of fact, if we have many coils, we can increase this even further, okay? So we need a good definition of flux Weber's. Like, you know, we're talking about this sort of amorphous concept of lines. What's actually going on here? Well, a useful thing is Faraday's law, which basically says that if a conductor is cut by magnetic lines of force, you can induce a, vol a voltage. So E, that induced voltage, is equal to a negative change in flux versus time. Now, this is just relative motion. So you could have a fixed magnetic field and then a conductor moving through it, which would be the case with something like a microphone, a dynamic microphone, or the exact opposite. Okay, you could have a changing magnetic field with a stationary conductor. Okay, it works both ways. So we just need relative, relative change. So we can define 
what a Weber is. And essentially what we're going to look at is this, again, this dynamic situation. If you can imagine, along, along the horizontal we have time, and on the vertical we have the flux. So if you could imagine having a certain flux that you start with, if you were to decrease that flux at a constant rate so that over the course of one second, right, you start at this flux, you bring it to zero. If that produces one volt in this single loop, then what you started with, that flux, is one Weber. Okay? So you start with a Weber. If you reduce the flux at a constant rate so that it reaches zero in one second, that would produce one volt on this single turn. Okay? That's how you define a Weber. That's one Weber. Okay. Now, as I said, if we make several of these loops, we can sort of enhance this this uh, process um, and to get a better handle on that, a, a metric, if you will, we come up with this concept of inductance. So inductance is measured L, we use L, we can't use I, you know, we already use I for current, for intensity. So we use L for inductance. This is measured in Henry's. Right, the Henry is the unit. Some people, when they make this plural, do YS. Some people do IES. Um, but the unit is the Henry. And it's abbreviated H. And we can say that the inductance L is essentially equal to the flux divided by the current. So 1 Henry is defined as 1 Weber one amp. Beautiful. Okay. Now, what you've got here, of course, is a magnetic field that's an energy storage device, like a capacitor. As a matter of fact, an inductor is sort of the twin, the mirror image of a capacitor. There are a lot of similarities between um, inductors and capacitors. It's the third item of sort of the passive triumvirate. You've got resistors, capacitors, and inductors. So an inductor is like a capacitor. They're considered reactive components. They don't produce power dissipation. Um, they store energy. Capacitor, it's in the, in the form of an electric field, and the inductor, it's in the form of a magnetic field. And the stored energy, uh, similar to what we would see in a capacitor, this is um, 1 half Li squared. You might remember for a capacitor, right, that's one half CV squared. So a lot of similarities. Okay, all right. So as I mentioned, we could sort of crank this up, this effect, by having more turns. So just imagine we have a whole bunch of turns over here. So there's a certain length to this, and there would be a certain cross-sectional area in here, right? So let's say I got this area. There's a certain number of turns we crank in there, n turns. And we can calculate uh, what the effective inductance is on this for a simple single layer coil. And there's many ways to make a coil, but for a simple single layer coil, the inductance L is equal to a characteristic of the core. This is called the permeability, mu. And practically speaking, you have two broad choices. You either have an air core, which has low permeability, or you have some kind of ferromagnetic material, you know, like a soft iron core. Permeability is much, much higher, and you'll get a much greater inductance. There are advantages and disadvantages. Disadvantages um, something like a soft iron core can uh, saturate, and in some cases that will create distortion. You don't want that. So, in any case, um, this is also proportional to the area, 
and the square of the number of turns, it's inversely proportional to the length. All right? So one of the tricks here is to get as many turns as you can for a certain length. How do you do that? All right? So think of it this way. Lots of turns in a given space gives you a large inductance. Okay? Well, if you think about that for a sec, what you would like to do in order to cram as many turns in a given length as you can would be to make this air, this um, spacing as tight as possible, right? You don't want to have it like wire, wire, wire. You want to cram them all in there as tight as possible. Well, that would sort of imply that you, um, you want to minimize the insulation. You know, if you look at a cross section of a normal, normal wire, you now the wire itself is that black dot, and then the insulation is this little ring around it. So if you have a whole bunch of these just sitting here side by side, you can see that you're really limited by this insulation, right? You have to have insulation. You know, if the wires touch, if it's bare wire and it touches, then you don't have a bunch of coils. You basically have a tube, right? They short together. So the way we get around this is we don't use a typical plastic sort of insulation. We use an enamel coating. So that's real thin much thinner what I'm going to be able to draw here, but you can kind of get my idea. If you look at uh, magnet wire, it actually looks like it's bare wire because you just have this sort of painted on enamel coating on it. Okay. And it looks like a nice bright, shiny wire, but it does in fact have this, uh, coating on it. So if you solder to it, you do have to scrape that off. You're never going to get soldered to, to adhere to that enamel. So that's how you can get more in that space. The other thing is to use a smaller diameter, a smaller gauge, right? Um, obviously, the smaller the diameter of the wire is, you know, the closer they can be. But there's a downside to that. You're going to have more resistance, right? So if you use a small gauge, a narrow gauge, which is, of course, AWG is a bigger number, right? AWG24 is a thinner, smaller diameter than AWG16, right? So I'll just say uh, small diameter will give you more resistance. And that's important. Um, it turns out that uh, that resistance, we call it the coil resistance, that has a major impact on the performance of these guys. Um, one of the nicest things that I, I like about uh, inductors is their schematic symbol, which is just, you know, a coil. <laughs> um, sometimes you'll see it with little bars next to it, like this. That's to indicate that it has a, uh, like an iron, like a soft iron, high permeability core. Now these might be straight. So in other words, it might be just wrapped around, you know, like a, a rod. They might be uh, toroids. In other words, they might be donut shaped. So a core might look like this, a ring, and then the wire would come in, you know, like this. Right, that's another way to do it. Different shapes. They might be stacked. Like I said, there's different ways of doing this. Um, but there's your schematic symbol. Okay, now ranges. There's a pretty wide range of values here. Um, typically, you would see microhenries, millihenries for most electronic applications. Uh, there are certainly devices that produce very high inductances. Um, you know, a good example of that is something like a uh, guitar pickup coil, which can be over a henry because there's lots of coil. You might have four or five, six thousand turns of really fine wire, you know, uh, like maybe a number 44 gauge wire that makes up that uh, pickup. So there's a lot of inductance. There's also a fair amount of our coil in there. Okay. 
All right, now um, the next thing would be, how do we combine these things if they're in series and parallel? Well, imagine you have two identical devices and they are in series. What ends up happening according to our equation? Well, you've basically doubled L, right? You got two of them, but you've also doubled N. Now you haven't changed the, the permeability or the area, they're identical. Well, if you double L, you double N, N goes up N squared, right? So that's a factor of four divided by two is a factor of two. So it turns out that these things add like resistors in series, okay? And guess what? They behave like resistors in parallel when you put them in parallel. Right, so L total would be L1 plus L2. When they're in parallel, you use your product sum rules. All right, so LT would be 1 over L1 plus L2, or L1 times L2 you know, uh, divided by L1 plus L2 product sum rule. Um, and that's what we're looking at for that. Okay. What about the current voltage characteristic? You know, we saw for a resistor, we have this nice Ohm's law thing. For a capacitor, we have uh, a rate of change between current and voltage. For an inductor, it's kind of like a cap. Uh, the equation's a little bit different. It's kind of like current and voltage are swapped. Voltage is equal to inductance times the rate of change of current with respect to time. Okay, for uh, a cap, that was I is equal to C dV dt, so they've sort of flipped. Now, I like to write this as di dt, the rate of change of current with respect to time, is equal to voltage divided by inductance. So if you had a circuit, and it consisted just of a, a voltage source E, and an inductor L, right, when you turn the power on, What you're going to see here for your current, right, this is time, it's just a straight line because you just have E over L, you know, whatever these values are, and this thing just takes off. Eventually, this is going to run out of steam, you know, a practical voltage source will sort of run out of steam here, and it'll die, just the same kind of thing we saw with cap, right? This slope is just E over L. So, for example, if your source was 9 volts, okay, and you had um, ooh, 10 millihenries for your coil, then that slope, that rate of change, would be 9 volts over 10 millihenries, which is 900 amps per second. All right, that's what the rise on this thing is. So it's pretty obvious if you had a typical battery, you know, after a very short period of time, you'd run out of current, right? Here's a really important thing to remember. Matter of fact, it's so important, I'm going to write it in red. If we look at this equation, what it tells you is that the current in an inductor cannot change instantaneously. Why not? Well, an instantaneous change in current would mean that di dt is infinite. If di dt is infinite, the only way you're going to get that is if your voltage source is infinite. No such thing as an infinite voltage source. So, can't do it. Remember, a cap voltage and a capacitor can't change instantaneously. So, for the inductor, it's the flip. Current in an inductor can't change instantaneously. Now, if we think about that for a sec, you know, if you had a simple circuit, I'll just use one resistor and one inductor over here. Before you power this thing on, the current is zero. As soon as you turn the power on, current can't change instantaneously, so it's got to still be zero. In other words, Initially, in a case like this, the um, inductor 
is going to look like an open. Right? Because that's what would have happened. If you had an open here, you'd have no current. Okay? So for the initial case, L looks like an open circuit. Remember, for a cap, cap voltage couldn't change instantaneously, so it initially looked like a short. If we wait long enough for steady state, guess what? L looks like a short. So the, again, the exact opposite of the capacitor. So if you're going to calculate this out, the instant you throw the switch, the instant you turn the power on, you just pretend this is an open. No current, all the voltage drops on the open. No problem with voltage changing instantaneously on the inductor, but current can't. We wait long enough, this thing just looks like a dead short, right? And it just looks like uh, just some wire, okay? In reality, practical limit, it's not really a short. It is whatever our coil is. Well, if our coil is a lot smaller than associated resistance, yes, you can assume it's a short. You know, it's a good approximation. But that's not always the case. So that's something that we need to look at, you know, depending on the individual circuit. Okay? All right. That's a good place as any to call it a day.